Here's something that nobody will argue, not even on the internet. The history of adapting video games into other mediums is full of really, really bad stuff. No, wait, stop, stop, don't, don't go away. I, I saw you going for the close window or the back button, but hold on. Don't worry, this is not the why aren't there any good video game movies episode. Good lord, even I don't think that dead horse needs any more beating. No, this is about bad cartoons. Completely different subject. After all, TV is weird. Now, when people talk about the almost surreal awfulness of legendarily bad video game cartoons, they tend to focus on a few insipid usual suspects. Sonic Underground, Captain N, which honestly is still kind of charming in spots, the US Street Fighter series, Oogtar from Super Mario World, you know the drill. But man, those are solid gold compared to some of the sludge you dredge up when you really look back through this particular subgenre. You gotta remember that until fairly recently, if you were big into any part of the gaming culture, you had to dig through a lot of crap to find anything cool or interesting related to it outside of the games themselves. Unless, of course, you lived in Japan, where they got kick-ass stuff like that Akira Toriyama Dragon Quest anime that's still not on DVD in the West, ahem. But here in the States, we mostly wound up with low-budget animation studios grafting whatever games were popular that particular month onto blatant rip-offs of older classic cartoons. This was the basic model for Saturday Supercade, an anthology series that featured such luminaries as a Frogger-branded knockoff of Walt Kelly's Pogo, Donkey Kong as a Bugs and Elmer riff, Donkey Kong Jr. as... <laughs> Yeah, that was a thing. I think you get the idea. There were a couple others over the run of the franchise. The only one that tried to get contemporary was their version of Qbert, and here's what that looked like. Q-Ball's acting sure lacks something. I'm glad Chew Puppy's in the play. Now to see who you are! <laughs> But at least those shows were based on games that had characters to work from. In 1983, the game drawing big lines at arcades was the racing classic Pole Position. A driving sim without any specific character or narrative? How would they make a show out of that? Well... They're moving real fast, they're the only ones who Let's can get there dance. on time. Okay, sis. And never too far behind, they're always fighting crime. Stop time, Dad. Ready as you are, Rody. Yeah, uh, too much 80s. Not that things got any better when the 90s rolled in. Remember Battletoads? Today, Battletoads is mostly remembered for its insane level of difficulty and the fact that the franchise never became quite as big as everyone assumed it was going to be. And that second part is largely because the game was created amid major hype as an attempt to launch a new multimedia franchise to rival the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. But whereas the Turtles got an animated series that went on for eight seasons and practically defined a whole generation of popular culture, the Battletoads got a one-off animated special that's even worse than you might imagine. I can't imagine why that didn't go to series. But that's not all. When this Go Nowhere Battletoads pilot ran in the States as a TV special, it did so alongside a similar one-off featuring, yes, Bubsy. And if you thought Bubsy was obnoxious in his games... Now, like I said earlier, the Americanized Street Fighter show is almost universally despised, and not without reason. But how many people remember that Darkstalkers got the same treatment? Well, it did. You can't be sure what lurks out there in the darkness of night. We're the Darkstalkers! Pyron, intergalactic collector of planets, wants the Earth. And he's going to get it, even if he has to wake the undead. Now here's what was weird about Darkstalkers. I mean, apart from the stuff that was already weird about Darkstalkers. Like a lot of shows of this nature, they invented a normal human character to be the audience surrogate. Now this particular waste of skin was named Harry Grimori, and he's supposed to be a descendant of a powerful wizard gaining magic training to help the good monsters fight the bad ones or whatever. Now you'll be unsurprised to learn that, as tends to be the case with this wretched template, the kid gets one of the good guys as a magical buddy-genie-sensei hybrid. Now what is kind of surprising is that they went with Felicia for that job. I mean, okay, it's Darkstalkers and she kind of is the franchise, but it just makes things unintentionally hilarious when Harry treats her like any other generic magical helper character, even though she's, well, you know, her. Look, just watch this bit from the first episode. You'll see what I mean. Whoa! Who are you? 
Then what are you doing in my room? I have no choice. I have to trust you. Last night I was attacked by a vampire named Dimitri. I think he wants me to help him rule the world or something. Yeah, and I'm the queen of Sheba. Now, I gotta go to school. My mom gets mad if she finds strange cat women in my room. So could you just go? Yeah, no. No. Does not compute. In this cartoon about the space alien conscripting vampires, mummies, and Frankensteins to help him fight Bigfoots and Mermen, this kid's reaction to waking up with, like, the fourth or fifth hottest woman in video games of that era just chilling in his bedroom is the least realistic thing that happens. And don't give me, oh, maybe he's too young to be thinking, bull crap. Besides, a few scenes later, he seems to have caught up to the situation. And what was that light beam thing that hit me? I have no idea, but... It's over now. You should go home. No way! Suppose that Dimitri guy comes back. Besides, I can be a big help to you. All right, now that's a lot of seriously what the f inducing game cartoons, but it's not quite the bottom. I've got one more awesomely terrible gaming nostalgia bomb to drop, but it's going to need an episode to itself next time. I'm not going to say what it is, but I'll give you a hint. I'm Bob, and that's the big picture. Last week, I took you on a tour through the nostalgic masochism of terrible video game cartoons, during which I happened to mention that I thought some such things actually still held up, kinda. Like the uniquely bizarre Captain N the Game Master, a cross-franchise team-up vehicle made possible by the Nintendo of the 1980s exercising the kind of control over their third-party content rivaled only by Tulsa Doom. Whatever the relative merits of Captain N actually were, it had the rare distinction among game-based cartoons of actually being popular and decently successful in its day. A rarefied honor shared only by the Super Mario Bros. Super Show, the two Sonic series, and Mega Man in the same era. Naturally, any successful series is going to have its imitators, but you'd think a team-up show like Captain N would be hard to knock off, considering not every license holder is likely to boast a roster of characters that could fill out a proper group. Well, you'd be right about that. But in 1990, Acclaim decided to try anyway, teaming up with Bobbit Entertainment and future Power Rangers mogul Hayam Saban to create Video Power. <laughs> Video Power was a slightly different animal than Captain N. Oh, it had a team of video game heroes being led around by a human kid, but instead of getting zapped into the game world himself, our main character, Johnny Arcade, really, commanded a team of game characters who'd been zapped into the real world. But even though they were ostensibly in the same universe, he didn't fight alongside them. Johnny just kind of directed the action from his game console and occasionally got involved. As for the membership, well, you work with what you have. And what Acclaim had at the time was a bunch of games that they didn't develop themselves, but rather published or ported to the Nintendo Entertainment System from arcade developers mostly. So here's the team they put together. First up, Kuros from Wizards and Warriors. This is actually what got me to watch this show at the first place. I loved Wizards and Warriors. Hey, where's my revival of that? Anyway, good pick, big dude with a sword, looking all Conan like he did on the boxes instead of the games where he was a knight, but whatever. Promising start, at least. Next up, Max Force from NARC. Yeah, NARC was the sh**. When you saw a narc machine at the pizza place or roller rink or wherever, you played it while you could, because it was only a matter of time before somebody's mom complained about the violence and it got taken away. Since this was a kid's show, Max Force doesn't get to have his gun. Instead, he has a utility belt and a lot of gadgets. Okay, whatever. Still a good enough start. Who else you got? Tyrone from Arch Rivals. Arch Rivals was a basketball game, and Tyrone is a basketball player. That's it. He's not a magic basketball player, he's not a famous basketball player, he's just some guy who's pretty good at basketball. That's his special power. Okay, what else? Quirk. This was actually a Game Boy Puzzle Maze title originally made by Atlas of Japan. Quirk is a tomato, and he gets angry if you pronounce that tomato. That is the extent of his character and his role in the show. And finally, Bigfoot. A monster truck, because monster truck racing had attained brief mainstream popularity in the mid to late 1980s and someone turned it into a pretty good NES game. But yeah, there's your heroes. A barbarian, a narcotics officer, a basketball player, a tomato, and a truck. Together, they battle Mr. Big, the bad guy from NARC, as the power team. You know what? There's nothing else that needs saying. Here's a taste. I have to agree with Tyrone. I'd hate my arch enemy, the evil wizard Malkiel, to see me like this. He's gonna use his lasers, Bigfoot! Go to hyperdrive! You got it, Johnny! You're not getting anyone, Joe. It's 
really not proper operational procedure for Quirk to go off on his own. He was angry about what Mr. Big was doing with the tomatoes. He took it personally. But Bob, Power Team? I thought it was called Video Power. Well, that's where this gets weirder. See, the Power Team cartoon was actually supposed to be the centerpiece of a game-based kitty variety show. That was Video Power. The 15-minute cartoon would come on in the middle of each episode, bookended by live-action segments featuring actor Stevie Pekoski as the quote-unquote real Johnny Arcade. How'd you like my boy Quirk? Not... Bad for a vegetable. Okay. Johnny Arcade was something else. He didn't just host the cartoon, oh no, he also reviewed games. The object is to work your way from the inner city wasteland all the way out to the woods where the Shadow Boss has his headquarters. A big difference between the NES Double Dragon and this version is that on Game Boy you start out with full power. And gave you gaming tips. In stage 5-2, go for the one-up behind the lower globe. But watch how Ryu glides from one edge to another. And generally just kind of goofed around in somebody's idea of what kids would think was a really, really cool house. But you know what? Lame as the power team were, and dorky as this whole production is, going back to watch it, the innocent, oh boy, video games enthusiasm is sort of charming. You know what's not charming? The show's second season. I'll warn you, things are about to get very 90s in here. My show is kicking with maximum height. Say video power. Yeah, that's right. Word. I've got the ability to make you win. You want the edge? I'll push the power surge. Yeah, for whatever reason, the producers decided to junk the power team and retool video power completely into a game show, a la better-known series like Starcade and Nick Arcade. Johnny was regulated to the role of omniscient mascot figure, while most of the hosting duties fell on Terry Lee Torok. And boy, was this hard to watch. And you, right to April's Loft and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2. Now, what are four guys doing in April's Loft? Well, we're about to find out. Video power went off the air around 1992 or so to comparatively little fanfare. The Power Team cartoons were re-syndicated independently here and there on cable years later, but not widely, and there's been no DVD releases. Because if there had been, I'd probably own them. As for the erstwhile Johnny Arcade, Stevie Pekoski is still working steadily as a character actor, making multiple Law & Order appearances and gaining some overdue grown-up notoriety as McGonagall on Brotherhood. And yeah, folks, that was Video Power and the Power Team. I'm Bob, and I can't forget this stuff, so now you don't get to either.